Okay, so uh, welcome back everybody. So I'm going to talk about uh, generic attacks against Mac, Mac algorithms and hash functions. Uh, there's a copy of my slide online. The address is here, so if you want to follow on the slides and move back or move forward, uh, maybe that can be easier. So uh, don't hesitate to stop me if you have questions, or to, uh, let's try to make it a bit interactive. And so uh, let's start. So uh, maybe just a quick show of hand. Who knows about hash function and generic properties of hash functions? Things like multi-collision attacks, things like that. Okay, part of, okay, maybe half of the room. Okay, so I will try not to spend too much time on the basic stuff. So a uh, hash function is uh, basically a, a public function that takes uh, inputs of arbitrary length, so an arbitrary bit string, and you output uh, a, a bit string of a fixed length n. And what you want is that it behaves like a random function from the set of functions with arbitrary input and uh, n bit outputs. And if, you're, if your hash function really looks like a random function, then it's very useful because lots of things are hard to do with a random function. It's hard to find collision, it's hard to find pre-images, and in fact, you can almost assume that a random function is injective because it's very hard to find collision. So you can almost pretend that it's injective and you can use the output as a kind of fingerprint of the input. So you can think of the input as a document and you use the output as a fingerprint of a document. And for instance, if you want to do a signature on a big document, you can just sign the hash instead. And as long as there are no collision in your hash function, uh, this is a, a safe way to do a, a signature. And hash functions are very useful. We use them in lots of different places in cryptography. Uh, we use them uh, for uh, signature. We, we can use them to build Mac algorithms. We can use them for commitment, for proof of works. And we also use them to instantiate the, the random oracle model in a more theoretical framework. So, there are, so the, the basic idea to look like a random function is of course not something you can formally define. So in a more concrete setting, there are three main security goals. The first one is that a pre-image attack should be hard. So given a target value h bar, it should be hard to find a message such that f of m is equal to this target value. A second pre-image attack should also be hard. So the second pre-image attack is slightly easier than the basic pre-image attack. Instead of being given a target value, you are given a first message m1. And your goal is to find a second message m2 such that f of m1 is equal to f of m2. So it's helping you a little bit. Now I'm giving you a first message and you have to build a second one with the same hash value. So maybe you can use the first message as a starting point. But in the ideal setting, you cannot really do anything with the first message. Anytime you change something, you get a completely different output. So in the ideal world, uh, the, com the, the complexity of those two attacks is just 2 to the n, because the best thing you can do is just try random messages and check if, by chance, you hit the, the desired target. And the third security notion is called a collision attack. And here, the goal is to find two different messages with the same output. So it looks a lot like the second pre-image attack. But there's an important difference that now the, the attacker can choose both messages, both m1 and m2. And because of this, it's much easier because of the birthday paradox. And in the, even if you have an ideal hash function, you just have to try to do the n over two different messages and you expect to find a collision. So those are the three uh, main concrete security goals. And just as a side note, uh, the notions are usually defined for family of hash functions, in particular the notion of collision security, because if you take a real given function, like SHA3 for instance, we know that there exist collisions, of course, because the input domain is much bigger than the output domain. So collision exists, and therefore there also exists a program that will just give out a collision. Of course, it's very hard to find this program, and we expect that nobody will never find it, but it exists. So if you try to define formally the notion of collision resistance, you cannot say that SHA3 is collision resistant because collision exists. And there is a very simple program that outputs a collision. So usually what we do is we, to fix this uh, little issue, is that we talk about family of hash function. So we see SHA3 as a family depending on some constant. And then the game is that given the constant, you have to find a collision. And now you cannot cheat anymore, and so it's hard to find collisions uh, in this setting. So, but this is not very important for what I'm going to say anyway. But you can keep in mind that uh, there, there are some uh, technical issues when we try to define security notions for hash functions. 
And this is because there is no key in a hash function. It's a completely public function. And that's the reason why we have those issues. So in practice, how do we build a hash function? Well, we're going to do it iteratively because we have to take an arbitrary uh, message as input. And of course, it's not practical to define a function that works with an arbitrary input. So the first thing we do is that we split the message into blocks, and then we will apply some iterative uh, function. So we apply the message block one by one, and we have some internal state. I denote the size of, as L. So we have an L bit state. We initialize with some fixed value, and then we process the blocks one by one. And this function H is called the compression function because it takes a state on the message and it gives you a new state. So it's compressing its inputs. And at the end, usually you do something slightly different. So I'm calling the finalization function G. And in many cases, it will take the message length as an additional input. So in terms of notation, H will be the compression function. And I use the notation H star to denote the iterated compression function. So you take a state and a series of blocks and you apply iteratively. So you, if you want to apply H star from M1 and M3, you first apply H from M1, then from 2 then from 3 And so the full hash function uh, will be capital H, and it's equal to G applies to H star, basically. OK, so this is uh, for hash functions. So I will also talk about message authentication codes. So this will be more for this afternoon, but let's have a quick look at what is a message authentication code. So if you look at the signature, it's very similar to a hash function. You want to take an arbitrary message as input, and you have an output of n bits. But there's an important difference that this is a keys function. So you have an extra input, which is the key. And that, that actually makes it very different, and also uh, we will use it in very different contexts. And the main context for a Mac is that you, you're trying to authenticate a message. So it will be the equivalent of a digital signature, but in a symmetric world. So we assume that Alice and Bob have a shared key, and Alice is sending a message to Bob, and she wants to authenticate it so that Bob can verify that the message does come from Alice. And what we do is very simple. Alice is going to send the message, and a Mac of a message computed with a secret key. So you just compute your Mac function on the message using the key, and you send it together with a message. So the message is not encrypted, but we only want to authenticate it. And what Bob is going to do is when he receives the message, he computes the Mac himself because he has a copy of the key, and he can compare the value with the tag that he has received. And if the value are the same, this means the message is authentic. So how do we build uh, okay, so first, what are the security notions for a Mac algorithm? So there are many, there are several different notions. Uh, the first one is uh, key recovery. Of course, if you have access to a Mac Oracle, so if you can ask the Mac of chosen messages, it should be hard to extract the key. And the, the main notion really is the forgery notion. So if you have access to a Mac Oracle, it should be hard to forge a valid Mac. So if you are given access to many messages with the correct Mac, and maybe you can even choose the messages and you are given the Mac, it should be hard to create the Mac of a new message that is not in the set that you are given uh, as input. And there are two slightly different types of forgery. Uh, if you can only forge for a message that you choose yourself as the adversary, this will call an existential forgery. And if you can forge for an arbitrary message that you are given at the beginning, this will be called a universal forgery. And of course, this is harder to do. And you can also define some distinguishing notion, but uh, let's skip that. It's not very important. So how do you build a Mac algorithm? Well, again, you're going to use an iterative structure, like a hash function. And you can see that this picture is almost the same as the picture for hash function. But there's an important difference that everything here depends on the key. So you have an initial, initial value that depends on the key. Then you have some uh, state update function that depends on the key. And the finalization function also depends on the key. And just to give you a few quick examples, uh, a very common Mac is CBC Mac. And it looks like this. It's using a block cipher. And so you use it iteratively. And then at the end, you do something slightly different with a different key. And another. Uh, common way to build a Mac is to use a hash function. And in this case, what usually happens is that the, the state update function will be unkeyed, so it will not depend on the key, and you will only have the key at the beginning, 
and at the end. And I will talk more about those construction uh, this afternoon. So um, in this lecture, uh, there will be two main parts. The first part this morning will be about hash functions and uh, combiners, and this will be those two parts here. And then this afternoon, we will talk about MAC algorithms and a different type of attacks, mostly on MAC that are built from hash functions. So let's start about hash function. So uh, one very important notion when you talk about hash function is the birthday paradox. And it's a very simple idea that if you have, uh, if you're drawing random value from a set of n values, if you're drawing r values, when r is about square root of n, you expect to have a collision. And intuitively, this is because when you take r values, you can actually build r square pairs of values and each pair collide with probability one over n. So if you have uh, r values with r equals square root of n, you have about n pairs. And so with high probability, one of the pairs uh, will collide. You can also do uh, the same analysis if you have two distinct sets. If instead of having one big set and try to find twice the same value in the set, you can have two sets A and B, and you're trying to find a collision between a value in A and a value in B. And again, if you set A and B of size roughly square root of n, then you expect that the intersection uh, will be non-empty. So I'm assuming everything is random here. So I'm picking the, the sets randomly. And in practice, how do you find uh, collisions? So if you do it naively, you're going to uh, draw R values, and then you're going to compare them. You're going to compare all pairs and check for a collision. And unfortunately, this has complexity, uh, well, square of R, because you have to look at each pair, and so this is very inefficient. But in fact, you can do much better. What you can do is you build your list of values, then you sort the list, and then you just have to go through the list and see if one value is repeated. And because it's sorted, uh, if there is a collision, the two values will be next to each other, and so you can find, find it efficiently. There are also ways to do it without memory, uh, and this is uh, called Pollard row. We'll try to explain maybe briefly on the board how it works. So if you do it naively, you have to store uh, about square root of n values. So this takes a lot of memory. And in fact, in practice, this will be uh, the, the limiting factor. If you really try to find in practice a collision uh, for, say, a 120-bit hash function, so the complexity will be 2 to the 64. So in terms of time, it's something you can almost do. But in terms of memory, you it's completely impossible to store 2 to the 64 elements. So you need another technique. And so Pollard row is something, uh, is something that is uh, really nice. And the idea So I'm assuming I have a random function f. Yes. So how do you switch it on? Like this? Uh, yeah, it's green. OK. So I'm assuming I have a random function f from some set x to x with the size of x being capital N and also 2 to the small n. Um, and the idea is that instead of uh, computing in parallel, instead of evaluating f on lots of points uh, randomly, like computing f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, and so on, and then looking for collisions, I'm going to start from some value x0, and then I'm going to do it uh, sequentially Iteratively, I'm going to apply the function. So I will have x1 will be f of x0, x2 will be f of x1, and so on. So I'm applying the function like this. Every time I'm going through f, and I'm computing a chain of iterations like this. And at some point, I know that I will get a value that was seen before, 
because, well, the, the space is finite, so at some point I must go back to a value that was seen before. So sometimes, so I will keep going like this, and at some point I will have two different applications of f that reach the same point. And in fact, if you look at, at this graph, it looks like the Greek letter rho. And so this method is called Pollard rho. because of the shape of this graph. So when you evaluate it, you know that there will be a collision, but now you still need a way to efficiently find this collision. And the way you do it is with uh, another trick, which is called Floyd uh, cycle finding. And the idea is that you're actually going to compute two different sequences, so you have a sequence x starting from some value x0, and you also have a sequence y, which starts from the same point, y0 equal x0, but then when you iterate, you apply the function twice. So you do f of f, sorry, this is y1, is f of f of y0, y2 is f of f of y1, and so on. So what happens is that you have uh, basically, you're computing two different sequences in this graph. One of them goes at speed one, so you're just moving one by one, and the other goes at speed two, so you're moving two by two, so you're moving faster. So you start here, one goes, x goes here, y goes here. At the next step, x goes here, y go there, and so on and so on. And at some point, both sequences will end up in the cycle, because we know that we have to reach a cycle. And then when, when they are both running inside the cycle, the y sequence that goes faster will eventually catch up with the x sequence. And so you can think of it, uh, it's sometimes called the tortoise and the hare algorithm because you can think as the x sequence as a tortoise that is moving slowly around, and the y sequence is the hare that is moving slightly faster. And so at some point they end up in the cycle and the y sequence will catch it up. And then you will detect sometimes here that both sequences have become equal. And so this means you have reached the cycle, but it doesn't give you the collision right now because usually you will come back from uh, two points here. So you will have the previous y will be here and you did two jumps and you end up here and the previous x is here and you do one jump and you end up here. But this is not an interesting collision because you have just uh, gone through the same path. So this is not a collision, but then when you detect this, you can restart the chain, and if you do it smartly, you will end up at the collision. And the right way to do it uh, is that you have to... So, first of all, you have to find a collision. Xi equal to yi, and then you restart Uh, from x0 and xi with two sequences at speed 1. <clears throat> and in fact, when you do this, it's a little bit magic, but when you start from this point and from this point here at speed 1, the two sequences will join exactly at the collision here. And uh, why is this? Uh, let me think again. So, um, yeah, so this is because if you denote uh, the length of the x sequence, so this value i here, this value i, it corresponds to this part here plus some part like this, right? So this, I'm going to call it lambda, and it's called the tail length. So it's what happens before you reach a cycle. And here you have uh, the cycle, and I'm calling new the cycle length. And what happens is that when you are at step i here, 
you have i is equal to lambda plus uh, something. Let's call it j. <coughs> uh, and you also know that the y sequence, it did two i steps. And when you do two i steps, you know that this is equal also to lambda plus the same j plus some multiple of the cycle length. Right? The difference between the two is a multiple of the cycle length because we ended up at the same place. So it means one sequence just arrived here and the other also arrived here, but with more cycles inside. And so when you restart from here, uh, so what happens? So you're starting from here and from there. And you know that the difference between the two is a multiple of the cycle length. Um, and so, yeah, 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 I get it. So when you restart your sequences here, the new sequences, if you do i steps again, they will both end up at this same value here. Because the new sequence, you're starting from here, you're doing i steps, so of course you end up here. That's uh, what we did in the first part. And the second sequence, you're starting from here, you're doing i step, and you also end up here because you're doing the same as the fast sequence in the first part. So we know that the two sequences will collide simultaneously, and so this means they have to enter the cycle here at the same time. And so you detect a collision like this. Does it make sense? Yeah? So I'm a little bit confused. The second cycle doesn't have the lambda, right? Doesn't have? So the, the sequence I start at xi doesn't have the lambda, right? Because it just starts in the cycle, so it doesn't have yeah. the, the lambda part. Yeah, you just start here, yeah. So uh, I don't know, if, if I start at x minus 1, the, the, this step, uh, I would meet at a different point. So, so I'm, I'm not, I don't understand why they are but they are colliding at this point, so. So what happens is that they are uh, synchronized, basically. When you do this second part here, you start from here and from here, but both go at speed one. And you know that after i step, i being the, the time you detected the first collision, they will both again end up here. So, so I understand why the one starting at x0 ends up there, but yes. why does this one starting at That's xi end up there? This one, well, this point here corresponds to doing i steps. And then if you do i step again, you also end up here because that's ah, how we okay. detected Got this it. point. Thanks. No problem. <laughs> is that good? So anyway, the important thing is that we can do this without memory. And that's really a nice result, that we can detect collisions without memory. And this is, in practice, this is really what we use because it's not possible to store all the memory. So I'm actually cheating a little bit. In practice, we don't exactly use this. In practice, we're going to use something slightly different, uh, which is the, the parallel collision search. Because in practice, we have many different machines. If we're trying to do a really big computation, we're going to use several machines. And this algorithm here, it's really sequential. You have to start from the beginning and iterate a very large number of steps. So if you have many machines, you cannot take advantage of it. So what we do instead is a different algorithm which will be easier to parallelize and which doesn't actually use cycles. We will only use long chains of iterations. So let me try to get it good. So in order to do parallel collision search, We assume uh, we have S machines that we can use, S computers. And so we're going to evaluate S different chains. So each chain starts from some random value. And then you apply iteratively the function f. Okay, 
And so each computer will be doing one chain in the simple case. And the goal is that the length here will be about square root of n divided by s. And when you do this, the total number of points that you are computing is about square root of n. So there's a good chance that two values inside this structure are equal, right? But the problem is, so you expect that there will be a collision inside this, but now how do you detect it? So it's not that easy because you don't want to store all the values in the middle, of course. You, you want to do it uh, with little memory. And if you, if you fix in advance the length of the chains, so let's assume we have a collision somewhere. Oops. So let's assume that uh, when I do this chain here, at some point, I'm going to reach the same value as in a previous chain. Okay? So what's interesting is that once you have a collision, if you keep iterating, it is still a collision. So this is important. This will help us to detect it. But, but the collision doesn't have to be, uh, the two sequences don't have to be synchronized. Maybe here you have just uh, 20 steps, and on this chain you have 1,000 steps before reaching this, uh, this value here that we are interested in. So if we fix the length in advance, they will not uh, finish at the same step, right, if we do a fixed length. So this is the collision we're looking at. So in order to detect it efficiently, we're going to use distinguish points. So in general, we have a collision uh, after, a different, after different numbers of steps. So we use a technique called distinguished points. And the idea of uh, the distinguished point technique is that we don't fix in advance the length of the chain, but we just fix a condition to stop the chain. So we start from a random value. We iterate the function. We iterate, we iterate, we iterate. And we have some condition that tells us when to stop. And simple way to stop it is to just uh, stop if the value we get is small. So let's say smaller than s over square root of n. And if I take this condition, I expect that the length will be roughly square root of n over s. Right? Because I stop with probability, uh, uh, I think I'm actually wrong. This is not what we want. Um, so we want to have this length. So we need to stop with probability s over square root of n. So I need to stop if I'm smaller than s times square root of n. Sorry. <clears throat> so I'm going to stop if s is smaller than s times square root of n. And this happens with probability s times square root of n over n, which is equal to s over square root of n, right? Because the size of uh, the values are in a, a set of size n. And so now you have chains that are roughly of the length that you care about. But since you're stopping depending on the values themselves, but not depending on where you are in the chain, if you have two chains that collide at some point, they will also stop at the same point. And now you can efficiently detect that two chains have collided. Oops, so we can detect collision in the endpoints. So when you detect it, you still need to do a little bit of work to actually locate the collision. So you have to restart the chains from the beginning. But this is not a problem. And the, the cost is still only uh, the length of the chains. So you're just doubling the cost at most. So this is not a problem. And so this is a, a very nice trick, because now you can do your collision search without memory and while using several computers at the same time. And the cost is still essentially square root of n. So you have a constant factor. And in fact, in practice, you will do more than s chains, because it works better. But the, the basic idea is this. And you can do this very efficiently. And that's really 
uh, what you're going to do in practice if you actually want to find collisions in a given function. And maybe just a final note. Um, if we look at the second uh, problem here, if you have two different sets, we can also do it in terms of functions. So let's assume we are given two random functions, f and g, uh, from set y. Well, I will assume it's from the same set. This will be much easier. So you have two random functions, f and g, and you want to find x and x prime with f of x equal g of x prime. So you're trying to find a, collisions, a collision between two different functions. So it's the same as considering two sets of values, but here I'm assuming I have Oracle access to a function that uh, computes the set. And if you want to do this, uh, it's a little bit more tricky. You cannot use directly the techniques I've just shown because, well, there are two different functions. So uh, what are you going to do? And in fact, there's a very simple trick. You, you're just going to define a new function. Let's call it phi of x, which will evaluate either f or g depending on some property of the value. So let's say if x is odd, you're going to do f. And if x is even, you're going to do g. And so this function, half of the time it does f, half of the time it does g. But it's still a function that only depends on the input. Right? You, you cannot choose it randomly. You have to do it depending on the input. Otherwise, you're no longer looking at a, a deterministic function. But now you take this function phi, and you're going to find a collision in phi, in phi. And with high probability, so you find a collision, let's say, x, x prime. And with high probability, you have x is odd, x prime is even. And therefore, you have a collision between f and g. So just a simple, nice trick. You define this function that does either f and g or g. And then when you have a collision in phi, with good probability, it's actually a collision between f and g. And so you have solved this problem here with two different functions. And if you see it like this, now you just have one function. And so you can use the technique of polar draw, and you can use uh, the parallel collision search. And so you can also solve this problem very efficiently. Does that make sense? OK. So let's keep moving. Um, so let's look at some uh, more concrete examples of hash functions. So I explained earlier that they are usually iterative. And in fact, a very common construction is called the merkel damgard construction. And it's used in SHA-1 and SHA-2. And it, it has this shape here. And uh, there are two important things in this construction. The first one is that the size of the internal state n is the same as the output size. So it's a restriction of a more generic case. And the finalization function is also the same as the compression function. And this is what is done in SHA-1 and SHA-2, because of course it's easier if you just have to define one fixed function. And this construction is very interesting because there's a security reduction uh, that if you can find a collision in this iterative function, it means you can also find a collision in the compression function. Uh, and if you can find a pre-image, it also means you can find a pre-image on the compression function. And this is just a black box reduction. If you are given a collision for the iteration h, you, can, you just have to look at a few different cases. I think I will uh, skip it so that we can move forwards. But you just have to look at a few different cases. And in fact, if you have a collision for the, the iteration, it means that at some point during the computation, you must have a collision in the internal function, assuming that the message is different, of course. At some point, you will have differences. And if the output is the same, then it means that one of the compression function is colliding. And if your compression function is uh, ideal or is good, it is hard to find collisions for the compression function. And therefore, it is also hard to find collisions for the iteration. And so this means that this way of iterating is a, a good way to build a hash function. And the same for pre-images. If you can find a pre-image for an arbitrary given output, uh, 
then of course it means you're also finding a preimage for the last compression function here. And again, if your compression function is ideal, it is hard to invert, and so it is hard to do this attack. Uh, there's another uh, classical way to do hash functions. It's called the sponge construction. And it's actually uh, quite different. It's also iterative, of course, so you can put it in the framework of uh, iterative hash functions. But it's quite different because you start from uh, a permutation pi. So here pi is a permutation, so you can invert it. So why do we use a permutation? Well, because we know how to build permutations, basically. In, uh, in symmetric cryptography, uh, we don't really know how to build functions that are not permutations. It's much easier to build a permutation because that's basically a block cipher without a key and we've been building block ciphers for many years. So we know how to build a permutation that look relatively good. So that's why we use a permutation in the sponge construction. And what you do is you have a permutation on B bits and you split the states in two parts, one of R bits and R is called the rate and one on C bit and C is called the capacity. And what happens is at, at each step, you're going to XOR your message into uh, the outer state. Then you permute. You XOR a message into one part of the state. You permute, and so on and so on. And the part at the bottom is uh, kept from one call to the next. So this C part here is important for the security because the adversary doesn't control it. And the R part here is important for the speed because it's the size of a message block that you can input. And in so in general, when you output your value, uh, if you need more than one block, you put an extra uh, permutation call in between, but I'm just going to assume there's a single call, so n is small enough, so that's much easier. And when you do this, um, the, the security of this construction, so the, the state, if you think of it as an iterative construction, the state is of size r plus c bits, but the security is mostly only uh, depending on C. And let me try maybe to explain a little bit. <clears throat> so if I have this uh, sponge construction, so I have my state split in two parts, and I'm XORing message blocks. 0 and 1, and I'm permuting. It goes like this. And if I want to consider it uh, using the general frameworks of iterated hash functions, it means that uh, this thing here will be my compression function. So the input will be uh, C bit here, plus R bit here, plus my message here, which is also R bit. And then the output will be R plus C. But this compression function is not very good when you think of it uh, in the context of Merkle Damgard, because it's very easy to find collisions for this thing. You just have to, to choose those two values with a fixed sum, and then you have collisions directly. And it's also very easy to invert this thing. If I'm giving you the output here, you just have to invert the permutation, you choose the message randomly, and you can compute the state input. And so even though you can see it as an iterative hash function looking like merkle damgard it's not uh, an interesting way to study its security. So the security proofs are very different. And in terms of, uh, of attacks, if you try to do a collision attack on this, actually you just have to collide on the capacity part. So let's say you have two different messages that collide here on the inner state. Then I can just choose the next message block in order to cancel the difference here. And then I have a collision for the full hash function. So the security really depends only on the, the part here. So that's why the security for collision attacks is essentially two to the C over two. And for pre-images, the security is also 2 to the n over 2, and this is because if I'm going to put a few more blocks here, this is because you can do a, a meet in the middle attack. So if you start from the beginning, you're going to set to choose messages here, and you compute this function here. So I'm going to call this phi of n0 m1, 
But then you can also go backward, starting from the target value h bar that you're trying to attack in the pre image. You can put anything here, for instance, 0, and then you can compute backwards. So you can permute. Here you can XOR uh, something, let's call it M5. You can permute. You can XOR something, let's call it M4. You can permute again. And then you can go until this value here, and this one I'm calling it phi of M4, M5. And this is something you can compute uh, very efficiently. You just start from the target value, choose messages, and compute backwards. But now you just have to find a collision between phi and psi. And when you have a collision, it means this value uh, here is the same. And here you might have different values, but you can just choose your final message here. Uh, OK, I'm missing one. You can choose your final message here to connect the two parts, and then you have a pre-image for the full uh, iteration. And so what's interesting is that the pre-image attack, the complexity is actually the same as the collision attack. It's only 2 to the c over 2. And this is because you can efficiently invert the, the iteration. So there are different ways to set your parameters for the sponge function. Uh, if you look at the, the Shaffrey instances, the ones that are called Shaffrey, they use a capacity that is twice the security level. So this means that all those terms 2 to the c over 2, they basically go away in the security. And if you look at the shake variants, uh, they are different. The security is defined is a, a fixed value n, and then you choose your capacity as um, hmm, you choose your, your capacity as uh, 2n, basically. So this is for the sponge. Now, if you want to, to compare a little bit, in the case of merkel damgard we know that uh, the collision security is a 2 to the n over 2, because we have this reduction proof. We know that the pre-image security is 2 to the n, again, because we have this reduction proof. Uh, this is, of course, assuming uh, an ideal compression function. So this means we have ideal security for those two notions. So this is very nice about the, the merkel damgard construction. If you look at the sponge, the security is just 2 to the c over 2. So it's not, well, depending how you choose c, it's not ideal. And then if you think about security proofs, in the sponge case, you have an indifferentiability proof up to 2 to the c over 2. So this means before 2 to the c over 2, you cannot do anything. And after that, you can do everything, because you can do pre-images. So we really have a good understanding of the security. Before 2 to the 2 to the c over 2, everything is perfect. After that, everything breaks down. In the case of merkel damgard it's a little bit more tricky. We know that up to 2 to the n over 2, everything is perfect. At 2 to the n over 2, you can find collisions, but you cannot find pre-images. So some security notion go above this limit of 2 to the n over 2. But we don't know exactly what security notion will go above and what security notion will not go above, because you can think of many different security notions, and this will actually be the, the topic of uh, the, the reminder of this talk. What about other security notions? What's happening really between 2 to the n over 2 and 2 to the n? We know that we will not be able to compute pre-images, but maybe we can compute something else that is harder than collisions, but still easier than pre-images. And in fact, there are lots of nice results when you look at this type of generic attacks. So a generic attack is an attack where you only look at the structure of the mode and you don't look inside the compression function. So when we talk about hash functions, uh, we know there are lots of attacks on the compression function. If you think of MD5 or SHA-1, uh, there's been very interesting attacks uh, based on specific properties of the compression function. But this is not what I'm talking about today. I'm assuming the compression function is good and I'm trying to find out what happens to the iteration. What notions can we break and what notions can we not break? And in fact, there are lots of really nice results and with uh, lots of uh, combinatorial structure in it. So I thought it would be a, a nice uh, topic for this school. So let's start with uh, a simple example for the length extension attack or property because it's not necessarily an attack. And the idea is very simple. Uh, when you look at the merkel damgard construction, I told you that the, the, the finalization function is the same as the compression function. And because of this, you can take the, the hash of a message, and then you can continue the computation. And this works even if you don't really know the message. 
So let's assume that the beginning of a message is secret, so it's a key. Then you have some message, and then you have the finalization function, and I told you it's taking the message length as input. So this means if you compute the hash of the key and some message block, the first compression function gets the key, then you get the message, and then you get this fixed value 2, which is the number of blocks. And actually, from this hash value, you can inject it here, and you can continue the computation, and you can put some arbitrary block, and then you can put the finalization function. And here you have to put the fixed value 4, because this is the number of blocks that come before. 1, 2, 3, 4. And then what you get is the hash of the key, followed by a message, followed by this fixed value 2, followed by a P. And what's important is that you can compute this value, h of km to p, just from h km without knowing the actual key. Just by knowing some computation done on the key, but not the key itself. And this is important because this construction, uh, using the key concatenated with a message, this should be a secure MAC if the hash function was an ideal function. If you take an ideal function, you put a key, you put a message, you get a good MAC. Because if you don't know the key, you will never find uh, relations between the, the outputs with different messages. But here, if your hash function follows the merkel damgat construction, you can find relations between different messages. And this is something that you don't expect. So this property basically shows that the merkel damgat construction does not give you an ideal hash function. Even if you have an ideal compression function, you're not getting an ideal hash function because of this extension property. Luckily, it's very easy to fix. You just have to do something different at the end. And this all goes away. And then you can use it securely as a Mac. Uh, does it make sense? Or is it a bit? So I will come back to this uh, in the afternoon anyway. But I hope it's clear. So another example of property that you have uh, when you iterate your, your compression function is that you can extend collisions. So let's assume you find a collision between two messages. So you have a collision in the internal state. Then you know that if you add another block afterwards, you still get a collision. Because of course, your state is the same. So if you use the same message, you still get the same state and you get the same hash. So this seems very simple, but it's actually a distinguishing property. Uh, this only works because it's an iterated hash function. If you had a really ideal function, you, you wouldn't be able to do something like this. And it shows that an iterated hash function can be distinguished from ideal with about two to the end of the two queries. And this works even if you have a finalization function. And you can also go further, starting from this basic idea that once you have a collision, you can extend it. What you can also do is find a collision and then compute another collision after the first one. So you first find a collision m0, m0 prime. You get some state. And from this new state, you compute a collision m1, m1 prime. And you get a new state. And then you compute a new collision, and so on, and so on. And if you repeat this t times, what you get is a graph like this. And actually, you can take any path in this graph. And you will always end up in the same state. And this means you have a big set of messages. You, can, you have all those messages here. At each step, you can choose either m0, mi, or mi prime. So you have two to the t different messages. And all of them go to the same uh, final value. And this is something that is very hard for a random function, finding many values with the same output. This is uh, normally very hard. The complexity is almost two to the n when t is big enough. But for this type of iterated construction, the complexity is essentially 2 to the n over 2. So it's much easier to build this kind of structure. You can also twist it a little bit. Instead of doing this basic multi-collision uh, with just one block, so here you have one block and one block every time, you can also twist it a little bit and have uh, different numbers of blocks. So when you find your first collision, you, sh you choose one block for m0 and 1 plus 1, two blocks for m0 prime. Then you get some value here. And starting from this value, you look again for a collision. And then on one side, you put one block. And on the other, you put 1 plus 2. And then you put 1 on one side and 1 plus 4. 1, 1 plus 8, 1, 1 plus 16, and so on and so forth. And in the end, what you get is, again, a big set of messages. All the messages end up in the same final state. But the messages don't have the same length. 
because depending on which path you take in this graph, you're going to have a different length. Each of them has a different length, and you can reach any length between t and t plus 2 to the minus t minus 1. This is just because of the construction. If you want to reach a fixed length, you just have to look at the binary expansion of the length you want, and you know exactly what path you have to take. And you will always reach the same output state, but with a different length. And this can be very interesting for some attacks. And this is quite efficient to build. The complexity is, again, essentially t times 2 to the n over 2. Unless, actually, uh, when t is very big, if t is bigger than 2 to the n over 2, then this becomes the dominant term. And the complexity will be uh, dominated by the, the length of uh, the, the, the longer message in your structure. So why is this useful to build this structure? You can actually use this to do a very nice attack, a second pre-image, assuming you have a very long message initially. So uh, I explained earlier what is a second pre-image attack. The idea is that you start, you are given a message, and you must find a second message with the same hash. And here I'm assuming that the first message is long. And this will actually help you. Because when you look at the first message, so you start from the initial value, you compute the message, the message is given to you, the function is completely public, so of course you can compute the hash of the message yourself, and you can look at all the intermediate values here. And so you have, if you have a message of length 2 to the s, you have 2 to the s different intermediate values here. And then you, what you can do is start from the IV, choose a random block R, evaluate your compression function on the IV and R, and with some probability, you will hit one of the values here in this set that correspond to the evaluation on the challenge. And when this happens, well, what you would like to do is just take this message R, then take the reminder of the challenge here, and then you will hit the value H of C, and so you have found a second pre-image. Okay, so it's very simple. The idea is just that you have many intermediate values in your challenge, and if you reach any of them, well, you know how to go from an intermediate value to the target value. You just have to follow the initial message, right? So this is very nice, but actually I'm cheating. It doesn't work that easily. Uh, and the reason is that here in the finalization function, you have to uh, input the length of the message. And when I'm building my new message here, are concatenated with the final part of the challenge. This new message is usually shorter. Here you have just one block plus this part instead of having this whole big message. So it doesn't work that easily, but luckily we know how to build a structure with lots of messages with different lengths that all go to the same state. So we're going to use this. So first we're going to build an expandable message. So it's represented with this kind of springy thing here. So we first build an expandable message. So we have a special value w that we can reach with many different messages of different lengths. And then starting from w, I try to reach one of the intermediate states for the challenge. And then I can just, just choose one of the messages in this structure. I can just use the springy thing, set it to the desired length, so that the full messages I have has the same length as the challenge. And then we don't have the issue in the finalization function anymore. And so that's how we can do a pre-image attack. And the complexity is 2 to the s plus 2 to the n minus s. So if your challenge has length 2 to the n over 2, then you can find a pre-image with complexity only 2 to the n over 2. And this is an interesting property, but for this type of iterated uh, merkel damgard construction, pre-images are easier to find, sorry, second pre-images are easier than pre-images, assuming that the target message is very long. If you have a short message that you are given, it doesn't help you much, but if the message is very long, then it helps you. Uh, I think I will be very brief here because I have other stuff to talk about. But there's another nice uh, structure. What you can do is, if you have many different states you are interested in, you can build a kind of diamond structure like this, where you try to make them collide two by two. And so you'll have different messages on each edge in this graph. And then starting from a set of size s, you can all herd them, I mean, direct them to a fixed value here. 
and then using this structure from any input state, you know how to go to a fixed final value. And this can be interesting to, br to break some uh, commitment schemes. But I will not go through the details. So we have all those uh, properties of the basic merkle damgard constructions. And of course, some of them are a little bit annoying. So there's been different proposals to uh, avoid those attacks, to solve those problems. And the first one is called the, the HIFA mode. And the idea is that you're going to put something different at the end. So this thing here will be in red. And the second thing is that you're going to put a block counter in each compression function. So now the compression function is different at each step. So you start with h0, then h1, then h2. So it's not the same function every time. You make them slightly different. And when you do this, uh, this will avoid all those attacks when you take a message and you move it to a different uh, part of the comp computation. And in particular, the, the expandable message construction, you cannot do it anymore when you have this IFA construction because when the messages are of different length, you're not computing the same function anymore. So you cannot uh, do this type of attacks. And so the second pre-image attack with long messages, it doesn't work anymore. So you, you get better security with this. And another way to increase the security is to just have a larger internal state here. So if you choose your inner state size to be larger than n, maybe uh, 2n, then all those things also go away because you cannot find collisions anymore in the internal state. But this is typically more expensive because now you need a bigger compression function, so it usually takes more time to compute it. So um, <clears throat> I will now talk in the reminder of this presentation. I will mostly assume that L is equal to N, but potentially you will have different functions at each step. We will have different properties depending on if the function is the same or is different. And I'm going to look at another way to strengthen hash functions, which is to combine two different functions. So one way to avoid attacks is to use this. You will avoid some generic attacks that are just based on finding collisions in the state. And another way is to use two different functions and to somehow combine the outputs. And hopefully this will give you better security. And this is something that was uh, imagined when there were attacks on MD5 and SHA-1. For instance, people were thinking, well, maybe if I use MD5 together with some other function, like RIPEMD, and I combine them in some way, uh, maybe I can make sure that in order to break the full thing, you have to break both of them. And this would be a, a very good uh, property, of course. And the idea is to get more security than, than from the initial uh, construction. And there are two natural ways to do it. One of them is uh, to concatenate both inputs. So you start with MD5 and ripe MD, and you just put your two outputs next to each other, or you could XOR them. And this will have different properties, so let's look quickly at what we know about it. So when you concatenate, you end up with a function with two N bits of output, of course. And the good thing is that uh, it's what we call a robust combine combiner for collision which means that if you can find a collision in the concatenation, then you must have a collision both in H1 and in H2, of course, because you want to collide in the full output. So this means if either H1 or H2 is secure, then the concatenation is uh, secure for collisions. So this is very nice. Um, maybe we get better than this because the internal state now is also larger because we have two functions in parallel, so the state is now two n bits. Maybe this can increase the security, but unfortunately, no, it doesn't. There's some really nice result by uh, Zhu in 2004 that you can use the uh, multi-collision structure that I showed earlier to break collision and pre-images for this concatenation. So let's see how this works. So let's assume we try to find a collision in H1 concatenated with H2. So this means we have two different functions, H1, H2, and we want to find a message so that when you look at the part for H1, we have two messages going to the same place and also for H2. And the first thing we do is to build a big multi-collision for H1. So we have this multi-collision structure here. So a big set of messages that all go to X1. And we know how to do it. And now we take all those messages, so 2 to the n over 2 of them, and we evaluate H2 on all those messages. And of course, since we have a big set of messages, we expect that two of them will actually collide under H2. 
And now we have a collision for the concatenation because those two messages, they collide both for H1 and for H2. And the complexity is essentially 2 to the n over 2, which is much less than we expect for a 2 n-bit hash function. So this, and it's actually the same as the complexity to break one of the function. And for pre-images, we can also do something similar. So again, we start by building a big multi-collision, uh, slightly bigger here. We need 2 to the n different messages in it. Then we look for a message here to connect our multi-collision to the target value. So we're doing a pre-image attack, so we assume we are given some target value h1 bar, h2 bar. So first we connect the multi-collision to h1 bar. And then, of course, what are we going to do? We just evaluate the second function h2 on this big set of messages. And since there are 2 to the n messages in the set, we expect then one of them, by chance, will reach the value h2 bar. And then we have our pre-image. And the complexity is essentially 2 to the n, because while building the multi-collision is cheap, finding this collection here costs about 2 to the n, and testing all those messages here also costs 2 to the n. So the total complexity is only 2 to the n, so it's much less than expected for a 2 n-bit hash function, and it's about the same as for an n-bit hash function. So the, the conclusion is that this concatenation it's good if you expect that one of the function maybe will be broken, you will still get security, but you do not actually increase the security by doing this. So the second attempt to combine is the XOR combiner. So here you're just going to XOR the two hash functions. So again, you have some nice property that it's robust for PRFs and for max. So if at least one of, so uh, if you do it with max instead of hash function, then if at least one of the Mac is secure, then the XOR is secure. So it means this construction makes sense in some way. Again, you have an increased internal state. So maybe this could increase the security, but of course not, because for the same reason, we can use the same attacks to do a collision and pre-images with complexity 2 to the n over 2 and 2 to the n. In fact, there's a generic result that shows that you cannot have a combiner that is robust for collision resistance. That's an interesting uh, theoretical result. But for, for what I'm doing here, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't give you an attack and it doesn't even mean that there exists an attack. It just means that there doesn't exist a specific type of proof of this construction. And there's also some nice result that um, even if your compression function are not very good, you still get good security at 2 to 2 vn over 2. So in particular, this construction, this XOR construction, uh, you cannot find collisions faster than 2 to the n over 2, in case maybe there would be uh, this type of weakness. So just to summarize, so we have two nice constructions, the concatenation or the XOR. We know that the concatenation, the security for a collision is exactly 2 to the n over 2. It cannot be less, it cannot be more. For pre-images, we know it's not less than 2 to the n, not more. So it's essentially the same as taking just one hash function. And we also uh, know that you can find some non-ideal behavior after 2 to the n over 2. And for the XOR combiner, you also have uh, generic attacks, collisions with complexity 2 to the n over 2, pre-image with complexity 2 to the n. So it's very similar, but we don't have uh, a proof that pre-images must be as hard as 2 to the n. And in fact, surprisingly, there exists a pre-image attack that is much more efficient than 2 to the n. And I'm going to explain this result now. And I think it's, it's really an interesting result because you're taking two hash functions that are supposed to be good. You assume the compression function is good. You're not going to use weaknesses in the compression function. And when you do this construction with two of them, you expect that you get more security because you have something more complex and that seems much harder to break. But in fact, there is an attack with complexity to, to the 11n over 18. So that's an annoying number, but it's basically slightly more than 2 to the n over 2. So you actually get something, you start from two functions that are good, but you know that you cannot find a pre-image uh, faster than 2 to the n, but when you XOR them, you can find pre-images much more efficiently. And so I will try to explain you those attacks uh, in the rest of this talk, and I will show two variants of this attack, one with something called an inter interchange structure, and another one uh, using cycles. And this will be based on those three papers. So here is what we're trying to do. So we are having two different hash functions here, h1, h2, and we just XOR them 
at the end. And the message blocks go to both sides simultaneously. It's really the, the same message that goes in both hash functions. And the compression function are different, and the IVs are different, and we assume that there is a finalization function uh, that can be different in both sides. And then you XOR them. So what can we do with this? I mean, wh when you look at this, it, it, it sounds harder to break than just having one hash function. Because the internal state is bigger. You have to, to control what's happening in both sides in order to do anything meaningful. So what can we do? Well, there's something that could be a weakness is the XOR here at the end. Because if we could somehow control the value that comes here at the top and here at the bottom independently, then when we do an XOR of two sets of values, we could use the birthday effect to hit a specific value faster than 2 to the n. But we have to control both sides independently. And so that's what we're going to do. So the strategy is to try to build some kind of structure, so some set of messages, so that we have some uh, ending state, A and Bs, for function H1 and H2. And we want to do it in such a way that when we have this structure, um, so we end up with some set A and B, and then if someone chooses a value in A and a value in B, then I can pick a message that will reach exactly this pair of states. So we want to build a big structure of messages so that we can reach any pair of states efficiently. And the way we're going to do it is that we will have a common message M that will be like the backbone of the structure. We have this fixed message M, and we will have some alternative messages. And I will use this graphic representation where the horizontal lines correspond to computing with the fixed message M. So you start from some value, you follow the message M, and you end up here at B1. So the horizontal lines are just stupid. You just evaluate the compression function or your on your backbone message. So there's nothing fancy happening here. The fancy thing will be the orange lines. And you're trying to build some alternative message so that if you replace one part of a backbone message with a different alternative message, then you will be following those orange arrows here. And you will be jumping to a different place. And so in the end, what, what we will do when we use the structure is that we will start from the backbone message and we will activate a few of those special messages. And this will allow us to move around between the lines and to choose where we end up. So I will explain in more details, don't worry. So the first step uh, to build this kind of structure will be something uh, that's called a switch structure. And it's something very simple. We only want to control just one line in H1 and two lines in H2. So that's really the, the basic case, the simplest thing you can think of. And of course, when you use the backbone message M, M, you know that starting from B0, you're just staying on the same line, so you end up at B0 prime. Starting from B1, you end up at B1 prime. And starting from A0, you end up at A0 prime. Okay? So if you are initially in the state 0, 0, you will stay in 0, 0. If you are in 0, 1, you will stay in 0, 1 when you use the backbone message. Okay? So that's just following the horizontal line. And then the interesting thing is that we want to define an alternative message M prime. So that if you are in state 0, 0, and you use the alternative message, you will move to 0, 1. So that is the goal. That's what we're trying to achieve. And so we will have this little orange rows that will represent it this way. And the orange row will go from B0 to B1 prime. And when we are in the H1 computation, we want it to stay in the same line. So it will be like a little collision here. So how do we build those messages M and M prime? It's actually quite simple. So the goal is to have all those equations here that just correspond to, to following those pictures here. And the way we do it is, again, we start with a multi-collision. The, the multi-collision is really a very powerful tool. So we start with a big multi-collision in H1. So starting from A0, we build a multi-collision. The end will be called A0 prime. And then we're going to choose messages in this big set of messages that all go to the same value here. We want to choose two of them so that starting from B1 and starting from B0, we have a collision. And the common value that we reach, we will call it B1 prime. Okay? 
And then this message here will be called M. This will be the backbone message because it goes from B1 to B1 prime. And this message here will be called M prime. It will be the alternative message because it goes from B0 to B1 prime. So we are changing uh, lines when we use this message. And of course, since M is the backbone message, when we start from B0, we end up somewhere. And this value, we're going to call it B0 prime because that's what we want when we follow the backbone message. And well, that's it. We just have to do this. We just build the multi-collision. Then we find the collision inside. And this is it. We have exactly the properties that we need. In the top part, we are always going to the same thing. So whatever message we choose, we're staying on the same line. And in the bottom part, depending on what we choose, if we choose M, we stay in the same line, B1 to B1 prime, B0 to B0 prime. But if we choose M prime, we move from one line to the next. Does it make sense? Okay. So uh, it's actually relatively simple. And this basic structure will allow us to do what I claim at the beginning, to control two hash functions independently. And what we do is that we're going to use this small structure many times and with many different lanes. Uh, so here we only have two lanes on one side and one in the other. But if we want more lines, it's very easy. We just have to evaluate the backbone message. And whatever output we get, we just call it uh, the new value uh, B prime or A prime. It's just we know that the, the, the basic message just have to follow horizontal line. So we just define the lines this way. And what's important is that when we use the alternate message, we can only use it from one specific point. We have to be in a specific state, and then we can move to a different state. But you cannot use it from uh, another state. And then what we're going to do is put those small structure in a bigger structure like this. We're going to use many of them, and we arrange them in a nice way so that we can jump from the initial state. So initially, we are in the bottom lane in both functions, and then we will put them nicely so that we can move to any uh, pair A, um, A, J, B, K that we want. So let's see uh, in a little more details how it works. So the first thing we do is we build a switch structure like this that allows us to move from uh, A0, B0 to A0, B1, right? Initially, we are in A0, B0 because that's the IV, and we want first to be able to move to A0, B1. So we just build this structure with those parameters. And if you think of it uh, graphically, so here the squares correspond to all pairs from A0, from A and B. And so there are, there are here 16 different uh, combinations that we would like to be able to move to. And this first switch here allows us to move from the initialization to the state here corresponding to A0, B1. Then we put another structure like this. But now we want to, to jump from the initialization to A0, B2. Okay, so we just have to set the parameters when we build the structure, and that's very easy. And we do the same to move to B3. And so now we can move in this first line of the diagram. Starting from 0, 0, we can go to 0, anything. And then we do the same, but in the other direction. So now we're going to move in the column. Starting from 0, 0, we can go to anything 0. And this is just doing the same thing in reverse. And then we can also do the same in a different column. So we're going to build those messages here. Assuming we are in state A0, B1, we can now move to A anything B1. And so this allows us to move to the full second column. And we do the same for the third column and for the fourth column. And just to give you an example, how are we going to use this? So we have a backbone message that corresponds to following the horizontal line. And we have alternative messages that we can use in some specific places to jump to a new set of states. And for instance, if I want to end up in A1, B2, I just have to activate this alternative message here. So I jump from A0, B0 to A0, B2. And then I activate this one, and I move from A0, B2 to A1, B2. And you can verify that you can jump to any combinations of outputs. And in fact, if you want two to the t different values in the output, you will need two to the t little structures here. And so the complexity will be essentially two to the n over two times two to the two t. Okay, 
And this is how we built this structure here. And this structure really allows us to control both hash functions independently. And so we will be able to do a pre-image attack starting from this. So how do you do your pre-image attack? Well, first you build this magic structure. So you have a big set of messages that allows you to go to any combination of states from A and from B. And this costs about 2 to the 2t times 2 to the n over 2, like I just said. And then you do the pre-image search itself. And what you do is you just start from those sets of values A and B. You pick a random block R, and you evaluate the finalization function with this message R. You look at all the final values here, and you try to find uh, a collision between them. Well, not exactly a collision between you, because you want to reach some fixed value h bar. So you XOR h bar on one of the sides, but basically you're looking for a collision. And you know that this will happen with a probability 2 to the n minus 2t, because the sets are, are of size 2 to the t on both sides. So you have 2 to the 2t pairs of states, and each pair could potentially be useful. And then after some point, you will find a match. And then you can just find your pre-image. You just have to select the correct message in this uh, big structure that you built at the beginning. You just select the correct message that sends you to the particular pair of output that you need. And then you have your full pre-image. And so the complexity of this second part is uh, 2 to the t. That's the complexity for one random block, because you have to compute those two sets of size 2 to the t, and you have to repeat this 2 to the n minus 2 t times. So when you try to optimize the complexity, you will select t equal n over 6, and you have a complexity that is basically 2 to the 5 n over 6. So it's less than 2 to the n, not a lot less, but still less. So it shows already that this XO construction is not good for pre-image security. And that's, I think, a, a very, uh, very striking result. So I will now explain another way to get the same result, another attack that will break the same property. But it will be uh, a bit different in that this attack here, using this inter interchange structure, it works on the HIFA mode. So it works even if your compression function is different for each block, because we're never moving things around. We're only computing always from one step to the next, and we're just looking for collisions, basically, when we do the, the whole attack. And this, uh, this alternative attack, it will use a different type of properties that will only work if the compression function is the same at each step. And in fact, what we're going to do is basically fix the message block to some fixed value, arbitrary. So for instance, just a block of zero. And we, and we will try to understand what happens when we compute the hash of a very long message with only blocks of zeros. So it looks a little bit stupid to do that, right? Just take a long message with only zeros. Why, why, why would we do that? And in fact, lots of interesting things happen when we do that because we're just iterating a fixed function because it's the same compression function at each step. And we're just iterating it. And in fact, we can go back to, uh, to the polar draw method. What happens is Eventually, we will reach a cycle, and we will start running around in the cycle. And th this is what we will uh, exploit. So what happens is we have a fixed function, h, with the message blocks fixed to 0, and we will try to look at properties of this fixed function. And you can consider it as a random mapping. And you know that when you iterate around random mapping, you reach a cycle. And this takes about 2 to the n over 2 iterations be before reaching a cycle because of the birthday paradox. If you look at what happens, Outside this row structure, you also have other values that can reach this cycle from different points, and you can also have several cycles. But I will not talk too much about it right now. Uh, this is also something that has been widely studied by mathematicians, so we know some very interesting properties about the statistics of random mappings. I will talk about it more this afternoon. But for now, I will just use this basic row structure. So the idea is we're just going to use a very long message with only blocks of zeros. And we try to understand what happens when we do this with those two functions in parallel. So when we look at what's happening in H1, we start from the IV, we iterate, we iterate, we iterate, and at some point we reach a cycle. Okay? 
And in H2, it's the same thing. We start from some IV, we iterate, at some point we reach a cycle, and then we go, we go around. But the functions on both sides are different. So the cycle will have different lengths, and the time it takes to go to the cycle will be different. Okay? But now, the idea for this attack is that we're going to use the points in the cycle as the sets A and B. Because they are values that are easy to reach, we just have to take a message with lots of zeros, and we know that after some point, we will stay in those specific set of values. And we can even control a little bit what values we're going to reach, because we know that depending on the length, we know exactly where we're going to end up. It just depends on the length of the message modulo the length of the cycle, right? This will tell you exactly where you are. And so if you want to reach a fixed pair of states, A, J, B, K, you just have to use the Chinese reminder theorem to find out the exact length that will give you a fixed pair of states. So to give you a very stupid example, with this uh, graph here, if I want to reach A0 and B0, well, how do I do that? Well, you just have to choose lambda, so that lambda mod 4 is equal to 0. And this makes sure that in this function here, if you do four steps, you are in A0, and then the length of the cycle is 4, so we'll, you will always be in A0, as long as lambda mod, mod 4 is 0. And in H2, it's similar. You just need to choose lambda mod 5 equals 3. And this is because if you do three steps, you end up in B0. And then if you add five more steps, you're just going around. And so you will stay at B0. And you just have to apply the Chinese reminder theorem, and you know that lambda mod 20 should be 8. And as long as you satisfy this, you will reach exactly A0, B0. And you can do this for any pairs of state. So this is really a, a, a very nice property. It's actually super simple. You just start with a message with lots of zero blocks. And just by controlling the length of your message, you can actually choose exactly where you're going to end up. And you can apply, again, the same type of attack. So for the pre-image search, you will do the same as earlier. You will pick random blocks R. You will compute the finalization function with R. And if there is a match, you will just have to select the correct length, and you will have your pre-image. So this is all very nice, but I'm actually cheating a little bit. Uh, because you have a finalization function that depends on the message length. And so when you try to use this message uh, to really compute your prime image, it's not going to work because at this step here, you have to compute the end of your hash function, and this actually depends on the length. So you have to decide here the length, but you actually know it uh, only here. So this will, there's a dependency that will uh, break this attack. Unfortunately, uh, well, so it's a problem, but fortunately there's a simple way to solve it. It's actually the same problem as I've explained earlier with a pre-image attack with a long, sorry, the second pre-image attack with a long message. We had the same issue that we had to control the length, and we used an expandable message to control the length. Here, it's the same problem. We'll use the same solution. It will be an expandable message. It's a little bit more complex because we have two different hash functions that we want to control at the same time. But luckily, it's not too hard to do it. So here is how we build the expandable message. Again, we start with a multi-collision for H1. So big set of messages all ended up in the same, same state. And then we choose two messages C and C prime of different lengths. So for instance, two blocks and one blocks. And then we have big sets of messages so that H1 of MC is equal to H1 of MC prime for any M in the set. And then, again, you just do the same trick over and over. You take all those messages, you evaluate them for the function H2, and since the sets are big enough, you expect to find a collision, and then you have two messages, MC M prime C prime. They collide both for H1 and for H2, and the lengths are different. So this is the first step of building an expandable message for two functions simultaneously. And you will just iterate this with uh, different lengths for C and C prime. And when you put everything together, you get your pre-image attack. So the first step is to fix in advance the length of the message that you're going to use. And thanks to this, you know that the finalization function is completely known. Then you build an expandable message, so the springy thing here, and you want it to accommodate message of length up to 2 to the t, 
so the complexity is 2 to the n over 2 plus 2 to the t. Then you do your pre-image search. Well, first you start from S1, S2, which are the states after the expandable message, and then you're going to put lots of blocks of zeros. So you find the sets A and B, which are the cycles that you reach from there. And then you can do the pre-image search. So starting from A and B, pick random blocks and check if there's a match. And then when there is a match, you can compute the length, um, you can compute the length, the number of zero blocks that are necessary to reach your pair of states that's interesting. And if this length is shorter than the, the bound 2 to the t that we chose at the beginning, then we can use it as a pre-image. If it's longer, we cannot use it and we have to repeat with a different random block. And the complexity of this step will be 2 to the n over 2 plus 2 to the n minus t. And when you try to optimize everything, the optimal choice is to take t is 3n over 4, and you get an attack with complexity 2 to the 3n over 4. So it's more efficient than the first attack, but it requires that the compression function is the same at all steps. And in fact, you can improve it using some slightly more fancy techniques. You can improve it to 2 to the 11n over 9, but I think I don't have time uh, to show you how to do it, but you can read the paper if you're interested. So to conclude, uh, we have two different attacks on uh, this uh, construction H1 of M, X or H2 of M, one with this interchange structure. So the nice thing is that this works even if your compression function is different for each block because the only thing we use is just collisions at each step. And the complexity is 2 to the 5 N over 6. And another nice thing is that you can also extend it if you use more than two functions. The complexity doesn't grow much. It's still basically 2 to the 5n over 6. And the second attack using cycles, this one only works for the merkel damgard construction, so if the compression function is always the same. But the complexity can be significantly less. And another drawback is that you have to use uh, relatively long messages. The length is the same as uh, the complexity. Whereas for the interchange structure, you can use relatively short message with only 2 to the n over 3 blocks. So those are basically the, the two attacks I wanted to talk about today. You can also extend them if it's not an XOR but some other operations. And you can also extend them if you have some slightly different functions uh, with a checksum. And this will be the end for this morning. I don't know if I have time for a few questions. Type over there, it's 11n over 18. Sorry? Is that 11n over 18? Oh, yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that wouldn't be very interesting. <laughs> Uh, um, so in one of the generic attacks against hash functions where uh, I think you said um, it was a one second pre-image attack uh, for long messages. Yes. And then um, because of the finalization function where you have the, the size of the challenge as an input as well, you had to use the expendable messages attack to yes. match. So in the end you get uh, another message which is of the same length as a challenge message. Yes. Yes. But um, is there a way to somehow uh, find, uh, is there an, uh, another attack of a w different, uh, of a message which differs from the uh, length of the challenge message? So something, uh, so if you have, uh, he if you give me M bar, the challenge, H of M bar, yes. then is there an attack which allows you to give an M which is of a different length than M bar? Oh, so uh, you're asking about the, the second pre-image attack with long messages. And indeed, what one uh, trick we had to use was to make sure that the, the pre-image we build here yeah. will have uh, the same length as the, the challenge C. Yes, yeah, so now can so you be asking, flexible? Can we find the pre-image with a different length? Yeah. So uh, no, there's no, no known attack to do this. And the problem is that you would have to find the pre-image for the finalization function when you do this. Because here we are, we are reusing the inputs to the G function, 
we are keeping the same length and keeping the same uh, state here. And thanks to this, we know that this value, we have many different iterated pre-images. If we change the length here, then we don't know how to build a large set of pre-images that could be useful uh, for the attack. And, and in fact, we would have, yeah, this would require to, to break the security of the finalization function. And uh, in, a, in a generic attack, we, we assume that this is not possible if the finalization function is good. So it will not be possible to, to find a pre-image of a different length. I mean, not with complexity below 2 to the n. Of course, with complexity 2 to the n, this is easy. But more efficient than that, it will not be possible. Thank you. So the, thanks for the talk. Uh, so in both results you show, you need like uh, target, targets that are like exponentially large somehow. It was two to the n over three, right? So I was wondering, like, what's the bottleneck here that we need, like, that, like that huge of a message, simply that huge of a target? Is it because we need that expandable message mainly, or? Sorry, can you repeat that? I so the, the if you go to like the last slide that you had. Yes. So, the length of the target is like huge, right? So, but you. Oh. Okay. Yes. Yes. And I'm asking, like, where exactly is it that we require the target to be that big? Okay. Is it because you need that expandable message exactly, or is it? No, it's not that. So uh, actually, one thing, it's not really a, a target, because I'm doing a, it's a first okay. pre-image attack. It's a first I'm not frame, taking yeah. a target. I'm just mm -hmm. building myself yes. a message. The input is just the, the target value. Yes. So it's a little bit different, because in the second pre-image attack, you are given a challenge, and, and uh, you cannot really assume you control the length. I mean, maybe sometimes you do, sometimes yes. you don't. So here, we don't have this problem. It's a message we build for yourself. So why does it have to be long? So when we do the interchange attack, the message is long because, uh, let's go back to here. If I want to have sets of times 2 to the t here, then I need 2 to the 2t different uh, little steps here. Oh, OK. I see. So you have to be something, to have something relatively long. Okay. So if there is a limit on the length, you can do a structure with smaller sets that will work. But then the complexity goes up. But it will still be less than 2 to the n. If you put any, uh, any arbitrary limitation on the length, well, okay. as long as it's uh, exponential in n, you will be able to do this, and we will, you will get an attack more efficient than 2 to the n. So somewhere between 5 over 6 and, uh, and n. So that's for this first variant. For the other one, uh, you cannot really do anything with really short messages, because you need yeah, at least to reach a cycle at some point. Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah. I mean, maybe you're lucky and you reach a cycle earlier, but this will really be more expensive. No, here it's very more natural that it so, should yeah, be So, yeah, in this attack, yet. it's really much harder to use uh, short-term yes, messages. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, there are some variants. Uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, you have to, to check in the paper. There are lots of variants of those attacks. And yeah, you're probably right, Itai. There are some variants with shorter messages. I don't remember exactly the complexity. Yeah, yeah. There yeah, there's a million different trade-offs you can do. <laughs> so if you check this, uh, this paper, it's a, a summary of all different uh, attacks that have been done in this space. Uh, and yeah, I don't remember exactly. But, but yeah, you're probably right, Itai. You can do something more efficient. But if you really want short messages, you have to use the interchange structure. But somewhere in between, there are possibly other types of trade-offs. <laughs>